Howdy everybody, uh, my name is Lee Hutchinson and welcome again to the second of our ongoing series of podcasts about Urquan Masters and our upcoming game, the Urquan Masters 2, where we talk with various pistol shrimpers about the progress of this game and the influences that brought us to where we are today. With me as always is Paul Ritchie. Say hello, Paul. Hello, Paul. That, that's got to be the oldest joke. I apologize, folks. Set I'm new to these podcasts. <laughs> Bailey. Oh, and uh, so today we're going to talk, we're going to take a little bit of a different tack than we did with the first podcast, and we're going to discuss um, some of, we're going to discuss influences on the games, but we're going to look at real world influences. We're going to especially look at uh, the arcade and game influences uh, that had their, that had influence on the space combat parts in Urquan Masters. Um, so I have a first, I have a nice first question here, um, and I know, I know it's a good question because you helped write it. Um, so the question is, uh, these games all deal with combat in space. You know, the uh, the melee and, and super melee are a huge part of the player experiences in Urquan Masters. And so, Paul, can you tell us, when did you first have a fight in space? <laughs> I've spent a lot of my life fighting in space. Um, and, and yeah, this is a question I really wanted to answer because I sort of feel like, in a way, the Urquan Masters was a game I was setting up to make my whole life. And that I haven't been able to get away from it. It's been, ever since we made it, stuck in my head. So for 30 years, I continued to think about this game, which at its core, you know, the resolution of gameplay is most frequently combat. Uh, and uh, for me, it started when my mom was reading me science fiction as a kid. Those were some of the first books, Dr. Seuss and Andre Norton and Robert Heinlein. And so the idea of you know, flying through space and having these battles has just been sort of part of the way that I handled, you know, conflict resolution as a kid, you know. Admittedly, I didn't have like lasers at the time, but um, I dreamt about it. And so my first real experience, to be honest, was at a place called Lawrence Hall of Science, which was a science center, is a science center, up in the Berkeley Hills I may have talked about it before, but it's extremely influential and formative for me and for a lot of other game developers, actually, because it was created in honor of uh, a scientist named Lawrence. Uh, he actually invented uh, elements. He, he was involved in early cyclotron development and the old cyclotron. This is Lawrence of, of the Lawrence Livermore Labs, right? Yes, yes. And Lawrence Berkeley Labs. It runs under a different name now. But So I grew up in Berkeley nine months out of the year and was surrounded by scientists. My dad was a chemist and his friends were chemists and my friends' <laughs> parents were professors in some cases in chemistry. So there was a lot of that floating around. And um, But it was a place that was funded uh, by UC Berkeley and uh, I think by a foundation as well to introduce children to science in a, a non-trivial way to really give them the ability to go deep for those kids who wanted to. And man, did I want to go deep. So they had, in addition to sort of the classic, like, this is a cell blown up to the size of a car. Um, they had a room full of these like hand-built machines that demonstrated some aspect of science. So you could tumble dice at these giant dice and they would spin around and then it would record what numbers they had generated. And then it would show you a growing graph of sort of how dice probabilities are, you know, this sort of bell curve. And then there was, you know, showing demonstrations of certain kinds of collision or ballistic arcs, or there was one about litmus paper that um, my friend Mark and I learned to hack and we ended up getting just reams of litmus paper out of that thing. But anyway, these places appeared all over the United States uh, in, you know, the 60s and 70s, of course, was my first experience with them. And a lot of it was funded, I think, by the panic around Sputnik, you know, which launched in the late 50s. Well, that's really interesting, Paul, but um, when did you have a first fight in space? <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, I do tend to ramble. Okay. Lawrence Hall of Science downstairs, um, there was a room full of teletypes and it was a, a system hooked up to, I think, an HP computer uh, in, in a big room uh, on the other side of the building. And 
it ran basic programs. Everybody was playing at the same time, time sharing. And there was a game on that uh, called Trek 73. It was one of many uh, science fiction sort of Star Trek simulators. And in it, you were dumped into space with up to nine other ships. And you had to essentially manage the Enterprise and blow them up. And it involved not just uh, manipulating your ship, moving it, turning it, but you actually were like moving energy from your shields to energize your phasers or load up photon torpedoes or launch an atom at probe. And you had shield facings. So, you know, you could turn a weakened shield towards your enemy. And there was a lot to it. It had a manual. And so I had played games like Bagels and Pico and Hunt the Wumpus. Uh, they were very simple. But I had never played an involved, difficult game before that wasn't from Avalon Hill. And I think I was about 11 when I started playing. And there was even a manual that we could share around. There was a master copy sort of stuck on the wall, and you could go photocopy it. And I used to just study both the rolls of paper that I would take home at the end of every night session. And because um, teletypes, you know, they typed on paper. and You could take the paper home with you. And then I'd study the manual and think about, oh, what if I did this with my energy? And, you know, what if I went all in on antimatter probes? So that completely thrilled me. But really, it was then the appearance of the first uh, arcade games, the sort of console-based games in Berkeley, that I just fell into. Um, you know, I had been spending, I had been spending probably four hours a week uh, playing on the teletype-based systems. And then once the arcade games came out, it was many days a week, um, any any amount of money I could get that I wasn't spending on D&D figures went into Space Wars, uh, which was, of course, one of the first uh, arcade games that had spaceships flying around shooting each other. And of course, it's based on a, a much, much older version of the, of the game. You know, it's funny, that was <clears throat> the the space war clone thing was one of my first space combat experiences too when we got our very very first computer which would be i don't know circa 1985 or 6 or somewhere in that area maybe maybe 87 but i think it was right around there um it was a computer that my dad brought home from work it was a big ibm pc 5150 not even an xt like a like a mm -hmm. you know big old original ibm pc with a cga card in it and uh, he brought it home with just a, a couple of floppy disks full of like whatever the guys at his, I don't think we called it IT back then, but whatever the guys at his office computer place like, you know, had just some games and stuff. And one of them was a little DOS uh, Space Wars clone. And, you know, it was, you know, CGA, black and white, you know, low resolution. And it wasn't very quick and it was running on a, you know, whatever that was, an 8088 or an 8086, whatever was in the original PC. So it wasn't great. Um, but it was totally amazing, and like I blew more time playing that than than anything else on on the discs. That was like the first game that I ever played and spent a lot of a lot of time with. Well, I don't know if you've ever actually seen the old PDP one version of Space War. Uh, I've from... never seen it. I've seen YouTube videos, of it, but I've never seen it run in person. We should take a trip down to one of the computer uh, museums or the computer gaming museums down in San Jose because they they've got them. And uh, every now and then they get them working again, and you can go see what it looks like. But this 1961 is an interesting year, because in 1961, at the end of the year in December, they begin coding Space War, which was on, again, the PDP-1 um, and at MIT, and it's three guys who are developing it. They've, I won't get into that backstory, but... I'd like to talk a little bit about 1961, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, this is uh, this is actually the next question on the list. This is uh, talk a little bit about how the times you grew up in affected uh, Urquan Masters and the genesis of. Sure. So, so 61 happens to be the year that Fred Ford and I are born. So this is a little egotistical. And if you remember the day that that uh, Star Control Two, the Urquan Masters begins February 17th. That's that's my birthday. So. Ah. But in 1961, a lot of stuff happens. And, and when I was thinking about talking about space and war, I wasn't quite aware of how focused this year was. So I'm going to run through more events maybe than you want to hear. But John F. Kennedy becomes the president in January. Laurentium is discovered in Berkeley. I'm born in February, but Yuri Gagarin goes into orbit or into space, the first human in space in April. And in May, Alan Shepard, the first American, goes there. In 19... 61 in May. Also, President Kennedy gives his famous speech, which includes the statement that, you know, after this decade is out, 
we're going to land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth. I'm going to interrupt you here with with the with the call out that you know that speech uh, actually works even better if you replace every instance in it of "go to the moon" with "blow up the moon." <laughs> I believe this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon, blowing it up, and returning him safely to the Earth. <laughs> yeah, that is great. We choose to blow up the moon. <laughs> All right, back to back to 61. Yes, I want to get I'm through sorry. this. Yes, back to 61. So, <clears throat> so in May, the very first man-made object flies by another planet. It's Venus, and it's the Soviet probe Venera. Um, Fred's born in October. He's young. Um, Shortly thereafter, and perhaps in response to Fred's birth, USSR <laughs> blows up the biggest nuclear bomb that's ever been detonated. It was 55 plus megatons, and it was called Tsar Bomba, according to Wikipedia. Um, again, not surprisingly, because Fred was born, President Kennedy immediately urges all Americans to build bomb shelters. <laughs> Uh, the Berlin Wall goes up, the beginning, well, not the beginning of the Cold War, but certainly a major step in its escalation. Uh, in December, America gets involved in the Vietnam War officially. And, and finally, the nice thing that happens at the end of that year, Stephen Russell begins coding space war. So if you go through that, it's primarily space and war and the birth of the two guys who made the Iroquois masters. So there may be something to that. You know, it's funny because I'm, I am, uh, you know, I was born in 1978. So you've got, you've got a few decades of me, uh, or you, rather you have a few decades on me and, um, I forget to do you do you do you consider yourself part of like that initial uh, wave of Generation X or do you still sort of identify as like a baby like the tail end of the boom? Um, good question. I actually consider myself the babyest of the baby boom uh, because I felt my whole life like I'm pedaling casually behind an enormous truck and there's nothing in front of me. There's no wind pressure, nothing. Anything I need is already done for me because this massive pulse of people have just been there. Like I missed the sexual revolution, quote unquote, but when I showed up, like they had birth control available at school. Um, there were no real rules about anything. You know, every single person at my high school had gone through stoned kids wandering down the halls. So there was almost nothing we could do wrong. And uh, I'm not sure if that was a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, for some of us, it worked out just fine. But I, I you know, I, I've never really called myself Gen X. And I think if I did, several people would kick me pretty hard in the midsection. So. <laughs> now, okay, so you mentioned growing up um, the science centers and stuff, which, uh, which I'd love to hear a little more about because I have, I have, growing up in Houston, I have my own answers to this, but I'd love to hear yours. Oh, so what about science centers? Yeah, um, so there were a couple uh, in the Bay Area that I spent a lot of time at. Uh, and, you know, I'm not doing science at this age. You know, I'm just fascinated by it. And that's actually sort of how it's continued my whole life. I've never really been a scientist, uh, much to, I think, my dad's chagrin. Uh, but I certainly took every class I could and, and visited. You know, I remember, uh, sorry, in 1970. I visited the Trojan nuclear facility, I think up on the Columbia River. And, you know, we were driving back from a vacation through Canada. And I'm like, well, we got to stop and see the nuclear power station. And they even gave me this little plastic uranium pellet. And it's like, this uranium pellet can be used for many things. When it's done, you know, providing power to millions of Americans, they can be buried beneath the freeway to keep them ice free. They literally said that. <laughs> So just don't get out of the car, kids. <laughs> Stay in the car. That's amazing. And I can hear, I can almost hear the film strip music playing behind you when it's like, yeah. this uranium pellet can be used for many things. Yeah, along with Hemo and the Magnificent. Um, so, but there was another place uh, you know, across the bay in San Francisco called the Exploratorium. And this place was way less slick than Lawrence Hall of Science. Clearly, it didn't have as much money from the government. But what it did have was an amazing number of volunteers and some actual scientists working there. And it was founded by the brother of the guy who led the atomic bomb program. It was founded by Frank Oppenheimer. So all roads lead to, to space and war. But um, actually, Dan Gerstein, the youngest guy in um, Pistol Shrimp, I think he's in his late 30s, mid to late 30s now. Uh, his dad actually built exhibits at for uh, uh, the Exploratorium. And 
Dan said that sort of the first epiphany in his life, his dad was working on this exhibit where essentially there were neon tubes that were about four feet long, and you could press a button and spin them faster and faster and faster. And there was a red one and a green one. And as they spun, you started to see the flickering of the neon tube at its 60 frames a second or 30 frames a second. I can't remember what it's flickering at. And Dan said his, he was the first human beside his dad to press the go button. You know, I think he was two or three maybe. And uh, when he saw that, he pressed a button, this thing spins and it's glowing. He said that forever just you know, completely motivated him to press buttons for a living. So that's what he does. And that's what he credits <laughs> it to. But he made a it, career out of it. Uh, some of the guys I knew who who would get into gaming, there's a gentleman, Dan Browning, who I met at UC Berkeley and who was a game programmer for years. Um, he worked as a volunteer, maintaining and as a docent. And there were some other guys at in Lawrence Hall of Science up in the Berkeley Hills. Uh, I think Mark Cerny, who I may have talked about last podcast, uh, one of the kind of central figures in arcade gaming and later in console gaming. Uh, he was one of the so-called Friday kids uh, at, at Lawrence Hall. And this was a group of sort of the smartest, most involved kids they could find, which in Berkeley, they were very, very smart. And they helped actually run the facility. I mean, they, they had a big hand in controlling it. And these were kids ranging from 13 to 17, probably at, at the least. I mean, I think, yeah, the, <laughs> the most I ever did there was I think I got to feed the iguana some worms or grubs. That was my involvement in, in sort of working there. Uh, but that was, you know, there were plenty of other science centers, but I'm kind of curious about you. You grew up uh, later than me, but still you were, I think you were involved in an area of the United States. I did, very I did. Well, <clears throat> very much so. I mean, you know, Houston gets a lot of stick for being, you know, in Texas. Uh, but growing up in Southeast Houston, which is where the Johnson Space Center is, that's where I grew up, um, in the you know league city area down here league city clear lake um you kind of you kind of reach a point very quickly in school where you realize that like two-thirds of the kids dads in this class either are astronauts or work at nasa and it was that way like all through all through elementary school and junior high and high school it was like there's there's a there was a very very heavy tremendous weight of like you know nasa everywhere which was cool uh, and so I didn't have the Exploratorium near me growing up, by the way, if anybody, we're not sponsored by them, but if anybody is in the San Francisco area, definitely stop by. Um, but being in Houston, what we had was the Johnson Space Center's Visitor Center, which in the 80s uh, and early 90s really wasn't much of a visitor center. Um, there really wasn't much at all, but they had a big uh, lunar lander um, test article on display. It's called LTA-8, and it was the, it's a full-size lunar lander that they used for um, to human rate the lunar landers in the Apollo era. So they they took this thing, they took LTA-8, which stands for, I think, Lunar Module Training Article 8, or Lunar Module Test Article 8. They put it in the giant vacuum chamber. Uh, they put two guys inside of it, and they made them stay in there while they alternately baked and cooled the thing in vacuum to make sure that it would, you know, be not kill everybody. Um, and they had obviously done this before, but they had to do it with people in it to, fin to finalize the human rating of the spacecraft. And they also used it to, you know, to help find down what some of the physical procedures are to make sure, you know, when you've got two guys standing in a small space and you're running down your checklists, you want to make sure that the checklists are done in such a way that, like, they're not going to be reaching, you know, into each other and, you know, whatever. So... They had this, you know, huge lunar module on display, and I remember seeing that over and over and over again and being absolutely fascinated by it. And, of course, the other thing on display here at, at JSC uh, since the mid-'70s is uh, the Saturn V rocket they've got. Um, there are actually three Saturn Vs on display uh, in America. Uh, there's one at the Johnson Space Center here in Houston. There's one at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And then they have a third at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. But... Out of those three, the one here in Houston is the only one that's made up end to end of all flight components. So if you if you ever are in the in the neighborhood in Houston and you stop by the the now much larger and much more professionally done visitor center, uh, take the tram tour over to see the Saturn V rocket because it's 363 feet of of absolute awesomeness. It's, you should be amazing. a docent. Clearly, I am a docent at that. I, I do tours <laughs> there. <laughs> I volunteer at the visitor center and do tours. I have an entire speech. But it's amazing because it is, it's, you don't have to talk it up to impress people. All you have to do is like everybody, when they walk in the door, they see it and it's like, whoa, because it's, it's this huge rocket. It's the largest, it is the largest vehicle ever successfully flown by humans. Uh, and it's amazing. Anyway, 
So I grew up immersed in space from the NASA side. Um, my, my family wasn't involved with NASA, but you know, I, we were like the only one on the block that wasn't. It was just sort of part of the era. It was, it was part of the background of growing up in Houston was just that there's space, there's space everywhere. And it was, it's absolutely impossible to grow up with that and not come to love everything about space, which that influenced me forever. That's the biggest thing, you know, I love reading science fiction. My dad was, was amazing for encouraging me and my brother also to, you know, go to the library, get whatever books we want, whatever computer games, like all that stuff. But I think growing up immersed in NASA culture is the, probably the biggest thing that has led me to sitting here and talking to you today about this <laughs> fun video game we're going to make. Yeah, by, real quick, there was a place called Mr. Mops in Berkeley, which was a bookstore and toy store. And, you know, every time I would get a gold star or whatever you got for reading enough books as a kid, my mom would take me back down there and I could either get a, a science fiction book or a rubber monster. And I later learned that my friend Errol Otis had the same deal. He went heavy into rubber monsters. I went heavy <laughs> into books. Uh, but it, it worked out for both of us. But, you can um, see the influence on both of you to this day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Errol to this day has the best collection of rubber monsters, some of which use <laughs> rubber that is no doubt toxic and illegal at this point. But, but I, I think... You know, I, I, I hope that I, I took certainly took my kids to the Exploratory Morris Hall and, and Chabot Science Center and the Oakland Hills and wherever we could go. But it clearly had sort of started to pass to ramp down, I think. And I think nowadays those kids who are interested in that probably are just getting it straight from YouTube. Maybe we should get back to space combat in games. One of the big features of Urquan Masters uh, and, and its predecessor, the original Star Control game, is the melee part, is that space combat. You guys managed to, knowingly or unknowingly, you managed to set a pretty solid benchmark for single player and, and two player space combat in computer games. But um, before we get into that, let's talk about books and writing and stuff first, because I want to know uh, what your opinions are about um, the best space combat in sci-fi writing, and I want to I want to ask this because I also want to ask about how much of the habits of good space combat sci-fi writers do you think translate into working well on screen for video games? Yeah, you know the the needs for games, books, movies are all different because truthfully, they're not space combat. What they are is an attempt to make you feel like you're there and experiencing some component of it. And you know, I read a lot of science fiction. I don't claim to have read. Uh, a ton, and particularly the the more recent stuff. But I mean, remember the stuff that most got me excited was Lensman, um, you know, E.E. Uh, e. Doc Smith, some of his early stuff. And I think one of the, I remember reading, a Larry, well, I liked Larry Niven. His action is always a little not flowing. But uh, Footfall, uh, the book about uh, some baby elephants invading Earth and, and blowing a bunch of stuff up, it had humans launching a completely cobbled together human spaceship. And it was totally believable that if you, if humans, if the United States could like marshal all of its United States resources, like A-bombs and, and Detroit, could they make a spaceship that could fight aliens? And, and it's believable because it's like riding up into orbit on a series of small nuclear blasts on a pusher plate. And a lot of its stuff is steam powered because that works in space. And they have some X-ray lasers, which again are being powered by small nuclear bombs. And I mean, this sounds like Project Orion, the nuclear bomb thing. It is mentioned in there. And uh, a bunch of people have to, I think, hide under a swimming pool or something like that, because when it takes off, of course, it's irradiating the area it takes off from. So to me, that one I really loved because it had such a strong engineering component. You know, it was describing not only the battle, but the technology behind it. Um, whereas Lensman was more like, gee, wow, this is so awesome and cool. And, you know, science is sort of not understandable. So don't even bother explaining to me what these things are doing. Um, you know, and gosh, I'm trying to think of other stuff. Like in in TV, for me, I thought Battlestar Galactica, the more recent one, was some of the more exciting space combat. Mm. And again, not because of the technology, because it was very retro and, and, you know, very, very late 20th century, but because of the way you saw how people were feeling 
when they were involved in it, whether it was excitement or fear or concern, and also the use of timing. Um, and again, this is probably something that is the least scientifically real, but, you know, a lot of stuff would happen at the last minute. Uh, you know, it's sort of like, you know, the cavalry coming over the hill. You know, everybody gets back into the ship before its warp drive finally spins up to get them out of trouble. Uh, and that's where you really, if you look at it critically, what you're seeing is how are they making me feel? What are the, the sequence of emotions that the writer or the filmmaker is putting the consumer through and how successful are they at kind of broadcasting the experience. So I think interactive space combat is different because they're, yeah, the, the programmer and the designers are setting up the context, but really it's all about what you do with your hands on the controls. And I think that's something that, you know, for anyone who's played Star Control 1 or Star Control 2 or the Urquan Masters open source project, you know, you're, you're holding your hands on this keyboard as though it had a bunch of buttons on it. And, you know, and that's kind of unusual. I think a, a lot of people back then hadn't played games much like that. And certainly nowadays, you know, we, when we put out kind of versions of Melee, People who are coming into it new are always like, holy cow, what are these controls where you go left, right, thrust, fire, special, you know, attack? Um, and I mean, have you played many arcade games that use those kinds of controls? I, I mean, the, the, the Star Control <clears throat> melee control layout uh, has always felt supernatural. Like not not super not ghostly like supernatural. Ghosts? It's always felt super natural, like very natural. Um but I think it's because I encountered it at the at the right time. You know, I encountered that first in the summer of 1991 or 1992, whichever it was. Um, and you know, it was you were, as a DOS gamer at the time. You know, there I don't even know if we had. I guess we did have a mouse at that point. Um, but you know, you you have a keyboard. That's the one reliable <laughs> peripheral that you know everybody is going to have, and so that's what you design for. And you know, it it, it always just kind of made sense. Um, but I'm old, and I did not grow up playing games with a controller. I grew up playing them with a com with a with a keyboard and a computer. So you know, I I understand that the perspective that I've got is not necessarily the perspective that new folks coming into the genre will have. My perspective was even more dinosaurs uh, timeline because I had you know the first games I played were prototypes of Space Wars at the Silverball Gardens, but then of course. There, the, the same person who actually made the very first uh, sort of console stand-up uh, arcade version, Larry Rosenthal, he went on to create a whole bunch of other games that use the exact same control scheme that I liked. Um, there, he sort of co-created a company called Cinematronics, I believe. And I used to play this game called Ripoff that was a co-op game where you're driving little vehicles around with those same set of controls trying to prevent these horrible aliens from stealing your triangles. Um, there was Gravatar, uh, which was, you know, you you had a spaceship very much like you have, say, in Asteroids, and it in some posing gravity, you know, either towards the bottom of the screen or towards the center of an asteroid or something like that. And I, man, I love that game. And I used to be able to put a quarter in it and play it just forever, which it turned out was a problem because it didn't do very well because it didn't make much money. So, Coincidentally, I had a friend, uh, Eric Wellmunder, who was working at Atari back then in their in their um, personal computer division. But um, he said, "Hey, we have a warehouse full of brand new, full sized Gravatar consoles, and they're going for two hundred dollars each. Get on down here and buy some." So I got a pickup truck, and I had been playing a lot of this game called Meal, uh, which came out same time as one of my first games and it was all about buying and selling and it had this music that went along with with that period of time when you were you know buying and selling things and got you into this sort of frenzy and so i went down there just with that music going in my head and i was going to buy as many of these gravatars as i could because i was positive <laughs> they were going to go up in value and i bought two and I immediately turned around and sold one to somebody else and i put the other one in my tiny little bedroom and I left it on at night because I was so thrilled about it. And so, you know, I couldn't really sleep very good because it was kind of bright. But anyway, so I ended up playing that thing more than you would believe until Errol could actually play it with his eyes closed. I, I couldn't, but we could play it 
a lot. And I still know those levels in my heart. And um, I think there's aspects of that, which I think we're going to try to add as um, moments in the new game where you're doing more than just a one-on-one -on -one space battle. I don't want to, right there, I've revealed something new, but uh, I think there there's more that you can do. I think do Dan may have cool spoiled ships. that one already. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, good, good for you. But um, so there was Gravatar, there was Star Castle, um, which had this sort of, you were fighting a ship inside a bunch of shields and you had to blow shields up and then get at the ship in the center. There was Space Duel, which was sort of like Asteroids, except two ships were you and another player. It was cooperative and you were tied together kind of by a rod. And so the physics was complicated if you didn't. It was like a three-legged race, sort of. Um, and, you know, there were a few others like that. Um, of course, Asteroids. I didn't even mention that. Um, that That's just one of the great experiences of my life was playing tons and tons of asteroids and silver ball. And then downstairs at uh, what was called ASUC, which was the student union center at Berkeley. Uh, w is anyone surprised that I didn't successfully graduate college? <laughs> um, uh, I went off to make a game called Archon. You would not be the only person I know who video gamed out yeah. of college. <laughs> There's actually another game. Is a, it is a tank game, which normally I'm not a super fan of, but it was called Laser Command. And it was wonky and weird because both sides, it was a two-player tank game, and both sides had like eight or ten tanks. You only could control one at a time, but you could hop out of the tank and run to a different one. Or if you could get past the other guy, you could blow up all of his spare tanks. And uh, that not a very well-loved game, but I always loved blowing up Errol's tanks, but sadly he mostly blew up mine. Uh, so... I had played all of these games when it got time to, to work on um, Star Control 1 with Fred. And so for me, it was like, of course, that's what you do. That's how you fly spaceships. That's got inertials, you know, and, and, you know, you have, you know, left, right, forward, fire, thrust, and we're going to add something. We're going to replace hyperspace from asteroids. It's going to be different for every single ship. And we sort of ended up really saying to ourselves, you know, it's neat to have identical ships in PvP, but what if we just make ships totally different and unbalanced? You know, so you can make balanced teams, but you might fight one very strong ship against one very weak ship. And that became the essence of, of melee in, in our games. And, and I, I think it's good, I know this has been said many times in many publications, but I like the fact that the essence of Star Control melee combat has never been about balance at the individual ship level. Um, I like the fact that if you are going to seek balance, you must do it through fleets and careful husbanding of your resources and expending which ship whenever, you know, expending ships at the right time. Um, I think that's great. Partially because, you know, uh, when I was growing, when we were playing Star Control as kids, uh, it was me and my little brother would be the person I'd play against the most often. And, you know, there was about a four and a half year age gap. So I was, it was at that age where I was just massively better at everything. And that <laughs> rapidly changed once we became teenagers together. But, you know, when I was 12 and he was eight or whatever, uh, you know, I could kick his ass at any video game ever. And Star Control was, was one that we kept coming back to because it was on the computer. My mom didn't mind that as much. She didn't like us playing Nintendo, but she didn't mind the computer as much. Um, and you know, he, uh, he, he was, he was my little brother. So he wanted to do what I was doing. And I was like, Hey, let's play that spaceship game where I blow your ass up over and over again. And be like, all right, fine. And then we would do that, <laughs> you know, and he would, he could get, he, and we got to the point to where he could fly the Urquan dreadnought or whatever. And I would pop into the Aralu skiff and just, you know, blow him up because he was eight. It wasn't like it was difficult. <laughs> and like, I, I, I just really like the fact that the game supports imbalance as sort of a feature instead of trying to, you know, take the tack that a lot of modern fighting games take especially and have and have imbalance be something that must be smoothed over. Yeah. You know, you talked about using the keyboard and um, one of the things that Fred and I discovered was that we had exceptional keyboards because we would hand the game out to our testers and these were actually a lot of our friends early on. Uh, and they would have tons of problems and we couldn't figure out why. And what we learned was you would think that you could press every key on your keyboard and that would be fine. You could, but that's totally not how they work now and not how they didn't work. You can only press so many keys at once and then you get what's called keyboard lockout. And it was different, I swear, on every single keyboard. So Fred wrote this program that allowed you to test it and, you know, write a config file. You, you remember that. I do. Uh, but we, we were talking, we, we met this game designer 
Andrew Leaker. Uh, he was young at the time. He's, he's done tons since then. And he was working on a game called Alien Logic. And uh, it was part of his Sky Realms of Jeroen uh, role-playing game, paper role-playing game. And he had done sort of a really interesting parallel to what I had done. I had been in high school. I had made my own role-playing stuff in high school at UC Berkeley and then gone on to make games. He had been at UC, at, at not UC Berkeley, Berkeley High School. He had done the same thing about a decade later with his friend, Miles Teves, a great artist, a uh, really amazing artist. And um, But they had played Star Control like crazy. And in so much <laughs> that when I first met him, Andrew said, yeah, I, I had to have surgery because of you. And I laughed and he said, no, no, I'm, I'm serious. I, I got really bad carpal tunnel syndrome in both my hands and I had to have surgery because of star control. And I was like, oh, thank you. I still take that as a compliment. But but uh, it, anyway, it, it's- And I, uh, I do like the, I also like, I like the keyboard jamming, the the, the utility that you guys released to, to help work with um, the keyboard lockout problem. Because it's- it, it, as, as, a, as a geek, you get a tool like that and you're like, oh, cool, I want to fiddle with this. This is neat. I want to press buttons on my keyboard and this is going to be helpful. But really what that was, was, was an example of what I think Fred brings to the table in a lot of these situations of working smarter and not harder and just making this the user's problem rather than trying to code a solution to handle, you know, X number of different keyboard variants. Well, I think that's the brilliance of engineers um, that they do the it Minimum right. viable they, product. Well... You know, I mean, I wish I could say that I could make any of the games we've ever made by myself, but I absolutely couldn't. Um, even back to Archon, um, Ann Westfall uh, was the programmer at that time. And, you know, I could plunk away on Atari 800, but it, there was no way I could program something like Archon. And that partnership, how she would look at things, and I would come up with some crazy-ass solution to some problem that would work in exactly that problem in another. And she goes, well, there's a general solution. We could do this and do all these other new cool things. And Fred is exactly the same way. You know, he'll, mm -hmm. he'll sit there quietly working away and then ha open up this whole new field of things that we can do. And I think Star Control 1 in particular, you know, we started out with something very simple about flying ships around and blowing things up. And by the end of it, you know, he gave me all this facility to think about designing new ships and uh, and then he created this whole um, thing at Toys for Bob, uh, which allowed designers really to craft most of a game's interactive capabilities. And, you know, the Skylander series really was empowered by all of that. So um, I'm all in on engineers. I love them to pieces. Yeah. No, there's a, uh, there's, there's a video by the engineer guy that's been, that's on YouTube. It's one of my favorite videos ever where he goes into the, um, the science behind uh, a coffee, a coffee, a coffee pot, a uh, a coffee brewer, like a drip brewer, um, and uh, it's fascinating because it's you know it's it is a p it's one of those examples of like a product where everything that doesn't need to be there has been ripped out, and that's the engineering ah. expertise. It's not making the complicated thing, it's making the thing that does everything that you need with the least amount of parts so that it can be produced ex expediously, and also it won't break. But it's but it's just a little bit away from breaking, and if you used it a little harder, then it might break. It's it's yeah. it's finding that perfect line. Strange, you should mention this, but I think I mentioned my father, the organic chemist, who maybe was chagrined that I didn't follow him. The only thing I've ever impressed him about, and seriously, like the only thing, was how I make coffee, um, <laughs> because I have had like the most. I drink a lot of coffee, and if I talk really fast, you'll know why. But I had like in wall you know, espresso brewers, and I had a, a lot of different methods and French presses and this is and that's. And eventually I narrowed it. To, I, I wanted the minimum. I wanted something I can put together when my eyes are closed in the morning and it's got the least cleanup. And I showed it to my dad and he wasn't impressed. And then I made him coffee. And then eventually he was recovering from the, something he had where he, he didn't have full use of his body and he realized he could make coffee my way. So ah. there you go. Thank you game designers yes we can do it um. let me touch uh, <laughs> let me touch on on sci-fi writing combat and space combat again and then i want to transition from this into the next big question um so the the influences that i've that i'm bringing to the table here that i think i mentioned the last time and that probably is going to get mentioned in every single podcast is uh cj cherry she's probably my big influence on a lot of the way that i see how aliens and spaceships work and she has a great take on uh, space combat 
in, uh, she's got a big series of books called the Alliance Union series, and there's a little uh, side, sort of side series off of that called the, the Pride of Chen'er series about a bunch of sentient space cats. And in, in that, she describes, uh, she does in other books also, but in that series in particular, she describes how, <clears throat> how combat works in her, you know, in her take on space. Uh, and it's really fascinating because it involves, um, it's sort of a realistic take. It involves, instead of, you know, ships firing broadsides at each other or little bitty fighters flying around or whatever, it really involves careful management of your energy state. And it involves ships that will zip into a solar system and carry with them a lot of inertia, and they'll have captured, uh, you know, a rock or an asteroid, and they carry that with them. And then, while still flying at, 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 at a high fraction of the speed of light, will loose that rock onto a planet or whatever, and then zip out. And then they'll swing around and come back and make a, make a second attack. And the amount of time that this takes is considerable. Uh, like months, months and months and months have to go by because for the ships as they're flying through the solar system at a high percentage of the speed of light, they're experiencing time dilation. They're, you know, and they're, they're smashing these rocks in and then they fly out and they flip around and they come back and like it just takes this tremendous amount of time and the distances involved are difficult to understand. And it makes for something where like if you were actually to, to try to watch visually and see it, all you'd see would be like something going past you really quickly. And then, you know, then you might see the planet blow up. And then like later you'd see something back this other way. And that's cool, but that's not, that's not necessarily dramatically interesting to portray in a game. Um, I also really like the, the way that the sort of amalgamated mind of James S.A. Corey, which is, which is, yeah, people, I was just going to go there with you, uh, has done with the expanse, um, which I think it, 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 it walks a beautifully fine line between space combat that is, that is like feasible, realistically feasible, but also is presented in a way where you, the audience watching it can find it interesting. It's not like dealing how it probably would be when you're just dealing with distances of, of millions and millions and potentially billions of miles where it's like, it's just not that the moment where you, you know, merge with the other ships, just not that interesting because you're going just too damn fast. The Expanse, I think, I think does a great job with that. Yeah. I want to talk, I want to say what you just said a lot more because yeah, uh, those guys did a fantastic job at capturing like powers of 10 scale of of space combat and conflict, mm -hmm. um, you know, from literally, you know, getting a rock out way out, way, way out in, uh, in space there and painting it black and throwing it at earth. And then, you know, yeah. plot happens and all kinds of things happen. And eventually the rock hits and, or down to, you know, ships firing and, you know, the, um, infinite repeaters, the, um, uh, the point defense systems right. that are taking out incoming missiles and, you know, and down to, you know, handguns and rifles on, you know, just the, the whole scale uh, is so well represented in that show. You can see the areas where they where they have to flex a little bit to sort of make way for the drama and to and to, you know, compromise. But they're also well done. Like, I, I, I wouldn't change. I don't think any of the dramatic choices they made to make space combat look better because, man, it just works. Well, yeah. And there, it's, it's an art to bend all of the rules and yeah. bring the audience along with you because sure if you sit back coldly and you know have a couple beers and dissect anything you can tear it to bits but um that show is just so fulfilling to me uh on, on a lot of levels and uh anyway i i think that they do a masterful job at delivering experience and taking you through this mm -hmm. emotional ride mm -hmm. while at the same time giving you enough science and enough physicality to make you feel like it's real enough and you know in in fiction that's the challenge games are part fiction but gameplay is a different thing yeah, this is this is where i'm going with the question okay. i think you already know great i'm bridging i'm bridging we're, we're bridging uh, so the gameplay is about providing a level of challenge and sometimes a bit of frustration to the player in order to achieve a worthwhile goal. And there's a lot of different ways that, that people put this, but if you were to make a game really easy, it's not fun. Um, it's got to have a, an ability to sort something out, you know, either get your hands on unfamiliar controls and then a little while later, you know, you're just a god. You know exactly what you're doing. You're not even thinking about the keys you're pressing. It's just happening straight from your mind to the game. 
or, you know, challenges in gameplay where you're trying to balance, you know, energy or, or ammo with, you know, risk about where you're positioning and how you're shooting at people. And so, so whereas in fiction, what you're trying to do is take someone along this emotional experience in games, what you're trying to do is take them on like their own little ex, uh, experience of mastery or the kind of the ups and downs of challenge or levels of skill that you achieve and then making sure that you give people the time to appreciate that they have just gone through this big jump in skill ability and it's not just and, and the best game designers like you guys will also make your games make it so that you can feel something it's like that old what, what was the old um what was the old ea ad tagline can a computer make you cry yeah <laughs> I remember that. I remember that came out. Oh, I was so mad at that time. Sorry, I was actually having my games published through Electronic Arts at that time. You you and, saw uh, farther along with the rest of us. It was all trip. I swear to God, it was all trip Hawkins. Um, anyway, sorry, I no, didn't mean, he to, was, I didn't he, mean he, to derail, but... Uh, yeah, no, sorry. And it was, by the way, it's Floyd. Uh, yes, Floyd made me cry. And those out there who know what I'm there talking go. about, God bless yeah. you. But, um, so back to, to game design, you know, I... I feel like I'm better at making games than I'm talking about them. But for me, there is this texture that you are trying to make, like food you're trying to make. It's hard, and you know when you got it right, which is how long does it take someone to go from that, I have no idea what's going on here, what these buttons mean, to, feel, to seeing them experience mastery, and then to making sure you give them a time and a place to execute that mastery. Uh, I'm sure that there are paradigms that this absolutely doesn't apply to, but the games that I find compelling to make and, and to a large extent play really deliver on this. Uh, and, you know, that I, I obviously love playing PvP games. Uh, that's something you can see by pretty much every game I've ever worked on. But, um, you know, it's also games like Space Chem. Uh, where you're trying to figure out this puzzle <laughs> involving making bonds or breaking bonds or getting a chemical into a little place, a little warehouse for chemicals. And when you get it right, it's just like so thrilling and so uplifting that you know, I finally did it. Uh, anyway, that's... And then, I see the, and then I see the chart where it shows how bad I did compared to how literally everyone else who played Never look at that chart. Like, I don't care. Yeah, you never <laughs> look at that chart. So when we were making ships... There were some that were more complicated than others to control. And you know, for example, like the, the Supox ship, which uh, I think is too hard to control. <laughs> I was tricked into believing that it was playable by a guy who was playtesting for us who just bizarrely could master all of the crazy maneuvering. <laughs> and he was just blowing me up all the time. We, we played melee constantly while we were making it. And, you know, I thought, well, I'll just get better at this, right? This is just one of those masteries. I'm going to get good at playing the Supox because this guy is just dancing around me, blowing me up. Anyway, I never did get very good at it. But the, yeah, the, the challenge there is give the ships some learning curve, but make sure that it's not unlimited because it's the combination of ships that make for the unlimited learning curve. You got to look at what your audience is here for. And and your audience in this game is not in, in star control specifically in the original game is not going to be there for, you know, a, a faithful adaptation of how flight in three dimensions and microgravity is going to work. They're there because they want to, you know, press buttons well, and kill people. I think a lot of people have wondered why we, as the years have gone on the 30 odd years or whatever, we didn't, make a more realistic science fiction game, more realistic flying in 3D. And there's two reasons. There's probably a lot of reasons. One is a lot of other people did it, you know, and some of them did it well, but uh, I didn't enjoy those games as much in combat. I thought they were very compelling and immersive generally, just being in space is cool. But all my weapons would just sort of be big red dots that got small really fast, or maybe they were, you know, missiles with missile trails. But what I loved about what we could do in, in the Iroquois Masters was we could make weapons that looked really awesome as they were flying through space towards your opponent, you know, clouds that would grow or, you know, watch missiles track someone for a couple of seconds. And I just felt like I had 
a relationship with the weapon effects and what they were doing over over time. Uh, and I think that flow and motion over time is part of its charm, which I just didn't get in a lot of the games where I'm staring at a cockpit and I press a button and you know there goes my weapon and um, also <laughs> sadly I am like one of the most motion sick humans ever and pretty much any time I'm playing a 3D game there comes a moment where I have to go lay down for a few hours um, so 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 far I haven't felt like making the game more 3D really served what people are looking for. Um, I think the immediacy of press buttons, dunk stuff happens. I see the ship from the top down. I mean, I can see the entire ship. I can see the relationships of other ships as they approach me. And, you know, in, in the new game, we're looking at having more ships than just two on screen. And so that relationship becomes even more important. And I don't really want kind of the, the, kind of the space opera that I'm involved in, this grand battle with all of these other aliens and other human players and all of the weapons flying around to be resolved to a bunch of red and green dots on a radar display. That That is, is not where we're necessarily headed. So for me, at least, I am still all in on the kind of left, right, forward, fire, press buttons, uh, or, you know, so I know some people really dig controllers, but part of me is like, I even want to go further. I want to, you know, we, we had made tons of peripherals in Skylanders and I just love arcade button control systems. And so I was thinking, man, what if we made our own? And I also know how much work that is and how expensive it is to get it going. So I know that continuing on with controls just for a second, before we put this issue to bed, um, I know we've, we have gotten questions about like why why don't all why can't all ships strafe like why don't we have more uh, why don't we have like an automatic like face opponent or orbit opponent button uh, and 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 I guess the logic being like if spacecraft spacecraft in real life do those things and that's actually kind of true uh, because I can tell you that that from all of the spacecraft that people have made presently from Mercury to all of the current stuff. Um, well, not really Mercury, but starting with starting with Gemini when you had digital autopilot. Most of the time, when you're flying around on a NASA spacecraft, you are not flying hands on stick. Um, you are sometimes, but under, under very specific circumstances, you are flying hands on stick. But for the most part, if you're in an Apollo capsule or a space shuttle or, or an Orion capsule or a Dragon, you're not like grabbing the throttle and grabbing a controller <laughs> and like like cowboying your way in. You're generally you're generally programming what you want to do into a computer that then takes, you know, what you tell it that you want to do and translates that into, like, the complicated steps necessary to actually do those things. And generally it's stuff like, I want to match orbital velocities with this other thing, because orbital mechanics is massively, hugely unintuitive, and things that you would think would be what you want to do are the opposite. You know, speeding up actually sort of makes you slow down, and it changes your orbital height. So anyway, it's... Real spaceships, yes, use uh, use computer control for almost everything. But I recall one of the things that you have said is a design axiom that you that you and uh, that and Fred both have is to never automate anything. That it's more fun for the player to do themselves. <laughs> I call that the Richie lesson because I have failed so many times to do that and have wasted people's time trying to implement that. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm sure I will again. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously, I think part of it is uh, you don't want your pilot on the, the plane flight across the country to be having a lot of fun and, you know, doing barrel <laughs> rolls and stuff like that. Uh, it's not about fun in that case. So, you know, I, in a lot of good science fiction, they just talk about, you know, space battles are over instantaneously because you have computers sorting it all out and, you know, or your computers tell you you're going to lose. So you just don't fight the battle. But but what we're trying to do is give you fun, give you moment-to-moment -moment excitement, get your heart pounding, get you feeling terrified and then, you know, thrilled and feeling totally in charge. And to do that, we have to give you direct control. Um, you know, we could do sort of the, the manager level uh, science fiction game where you're like deciding who goes out there and flies and what they do. But we actually have implemented that at times, and it's just not, it's interesting, it's just not impassioned. 
You know, it, do, it, right. it doesn't do what we want, which is get your heart pounding. And, you know, when I think about almost any science fiction stuff that I've worked on, I end up having to like justify why it is that humans are in, involved and engaged. And, you know, I mean, I think we even have something that will be revealed in the next game about why it is that manual controls are in vogue. You know, why, why does every single alien seem to have manual controls? Um, and we're not going to just use Larry Niven's psionic hand waving, <laughs> um, which I loved. And I actually read a book just lately that used it, which is that somehow only human minds can perceive this thing. So therefore a human has to be in the chain of command. Uh, that's the, Larry Niven's hyperspace controls. And um, I was just reading Adrian Tchaikovsky's book, uh, Shards of Earth, which is really awesome, by the way. I totally recommend that kind of stuff. Uh, but anyway, he had the same sort of thing that humans are humans are essential for some hand wavy reason. But um, well, this I mean, this is this is kind of the question that I was going to close on, and maybe this is where you were going. Is what um, how do controls feed into narrative? Because you know, every game has a control scheme, and you have the the formative games that we've talked about had probably a somewhat similar control scheme sort of to the star control melee stuff. Um, how did we, how did those controls feed into narrative? Where'd you start and how did we get here? You know, this is a, a challenging question, but it's real. Um, oftentimes I think games controls and the actions sort of mundane actions that the players take are reflected one way or another in the narratives. Uh, but I think in the case of Star Control, it's sort of a case of pacing and where the player is at in the chain of events. And the pacing in Star Control is, in just a few seconds, tons of stuff happens, and the player has made a lot of decisions. Um, you know, every button press is a decision. And, and also, the player is as close to the screen as possible because you know, everything that happens, turning, thrusting, firing, You've again pressed the button. You're the guy on the spaceship who's who's doing everything. You're not necessarily the guy sitting back making decisions. So, I think that relates to the role of the protagonist in our game. Is uh, he's the guy who is immediate. He is the one directly talking to people. He is the one directly making this, you know actions physically in the UI about what goes into the ship and what doesn't. And when we've looked at other UI modes that are a little bit more menu-y, every time we're separated from actually working on something that looks like a real or fantastical thing in, in the game world, I just feel like, oh no, that isn't my character. My character would be there. He would, you know, he would want to have a welder in his hand and get up there. Um, and so uh, we were talking a little bit about skeuomorphic user interface, and I hate using that word, but <laughs> I am it's a word that the, I think Apple has made sure that we all understand as of the last few years. I, I think it's, I mean, I, I, I disagree with a lot of people on it. I love directly interacting with a fantastical object. You know, I, I don't want to have a bunch of flat colored icons. You know, we fought hard for all of our colors. <laughs> I remember the four color CGA card. We can do better than that with, with our millions of colors nowadays. But anyway, so I guess for me, the narrative in, in the Erquan Masters is about you specifically. Uh, yes, you're a protagonist in the game, a, a one specific protagonist, but really the protagonist is a very thin membrane. You're the person sitting in your chair, the hero, and you're directly relating to everything in the world. And so I think that that intimacy is comes in large part because it fit right with the intimacy of your control over your ships in combat. And for me, that works. Um, you know, I want to hang on to that. I don't want to be separated by hierarchy, so to speak, from, you know, me giving orders to somebody who then gives orders to somebody who eventually turns a thing on the computer and something happens. That's, that's not even how I want to live my life. So if you ever have a spaceship, you need someone to fly that doesn't induce any motion sickness. I'm your guy. You know, I hear what you're saying about about keeping the player in the loop and wanting to have wanting that player to be the person with their hands on the controls, um, because there there are other games. There are plenty of other games. There are lots of other games out there that are like what you described, where you are you're giving the orders. You know, and they a lot of them are, are 4 X type games. But there's Bridge Star Trek Bridge Simulator. There's uh, the Star Trek 25th Anniversary was sort of kind of like that for the bridge portions of the game. And there's tons of modern games that do that. But my the thing that has always 
the hope that has burned in my heart for the past three decades that you guys would eventually get back to this game is that this space exploration RPG genre, these, you know, Starflight alike games are, they just don't, they just don't really exist anymore. You can see their, their, their antecedents all over the place. No, wait, antecedents is the wrong one. You can see their descendants all over the place. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, the evidence, uh, the, 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 the seed that Starflight and Star Control 2 planted in game design is, is all over the place. It's almost like the Yodorowsky's Dune of video games, except we actually made it instead of it being, you know, a drug induced fantasy. But like, you know, if you, those types of games, if you want to have that Star Trek Bridge Commander type experience, they're out there, but there are very few that do this, where you, you, you get to drive your spaceship through space, you know, interact with aliens and play and inhabit a role that's wholly you rather than, rather than a character that you're sort of, that you're sort of manipulating from behind the screens. This is a, this is a rare thing, uh, and I'm excited that you're doing it. Well, thanks. Okay, and now, since I asked you to ask me a lot of very specific questions about something that I wanted to talk about. I want you to ask me something that I'm totally unprepared for. All right. Um, oh, man. Okay. Um, if you could rewrite any conversation from Urquan Masters, which one would you rewrite? Oh, wow. Uh, that is kind of a hard one um, because I love them all. It would not be the Supox. It would be the Supox. Um, it's not that I would want to rewrite I was thinking them. that. <laughs> Okay, it's not that I want to. I dislike anything about them. It's just that they they were shortchanged. Like they had stuff going on. I had schemes for them involving them going to seed or or blooming or something, and instead they. I mean, literally at the end, they complain about sort of playing second banana to the the Ootwig, and the, the Ootwig had so much dialogue, so much dialogue. And then the they end up having to carry a lot in the third act. I mean, depending upon how you pace the game out, but they had to carry a lot. Yeah. Yeah. They were, yeah. So anyway, I feel like I wouldn't necessarily rewrite the dialogue that's there. I would go back and re basically take the conversations and provide a lot more depth and, and basically connect their conversations more with some of the other actions you do and some of the other aliens you do. I mean, I'd, it'd be nice if there was some seeds or <laughs> something you did with seeds. Uh, but that's, that's what I would like to do. Um, All right. Okay. Well, thank okay. you. No, that was good. That was good. We can we can finish as we do more of these. I'll finish them all up with with surprise questions about like regrets that you've had about your past work and you know, or just life. How you can self flagellate High school girlfriends. All of us. Yeah, you name it. <laughs> all right, and that I think will bring us uh, to the end. Thank you for taking the time, Paul. It's always a joy to talk to you about uh, all things, but especially about Urquan Masters too, which I know everyone is excited about. And I know at some point here we'll actually have some more meaty fun info uh so stay tuned to these podcasts because maybe at some point we'll actually drop some cool stuff okay thanks i appreciate it see you later lee thanks everybody mm -hmm.